Chapter 4 Fluke Victory Jacques' unexpected leave taking came as a bitter disappointment to Brad and Dan, who had hoped to learn more about the boy. We don't know where he went or why, Fred explained to the Cubs as they reread the farewell message. Dad and I carried a basket of trash down to the beach, leaving Jacques here. When we came back, he was gone. That was the only a few minutes ago, Mr. Hatfield added. Dan, you and Brad didn't see the boy anywhere on the beach. Dan replied that they had observed no one. Dad and I weren't away from the cave more than ten minutes, Fred further explained. I can't understand what got into Jacques. He seemed cheerfully earlier this morning. Maybe he was afraid he'd be asked too many questions, Brad commented, his gaze roving slowly around the room. Say, isn't there something different about this place? Different, Mr. Hatfield echoed. A chair has been upset and another one shoved against the wall. Come to think of it, both of those chairs were in place when Fred and I carried out the trash. Maybe someone came here while you were away and forced shock to leave, Dan, did, Dan exclaimed. The boy seemed well enough satisfied this morning, Mr. Hatfield said, folding and buttoning the note into a jacket pocket. That's what makes it seem strange that he'd leave without explaining. Suppose we look around down on the beach. Eager to search for clues, the boys clattered down the stairway ahead of the cub leader. At the foot of the steps, they noticed several freshly made footsteps in the sand. Scattered among the imprints left by the small shoes were those of a man's heavy-soled footgear. Dan, your theory about someone forcing Jacques to leave may be correct. Mr. Hatfield explained. The boy may have gone willingly enough, but that upset chair makes me wonder. Now rather excited by this discovery, the cubs followed the footprint trail for 20 yards along the beach. Now and then, the small circular mark appeared near the shoe print. To the observing cub, this indicated that a stick or similar object may have been carried by Jacques' companion. And see here, Midge exclaimed, staring at the confusion of prints in the sand. Doesn't this look as if a scuffle took place, Mr. Hatfield? It does, agreed the cub leader, praising Midge for his observation. Either Jacques stumbled or was given a hard shove. One can see plainly where he fell down. The trail of footprints led the cubs onto a paved road paralleling the river front. There, it abruptly ended. Well, we've lost him, Mr. Hatfield said, gazing up and down the deserted highway. And now we'll never know who Jacques was or where he came from, Dan said. About all he told us was that he was a cub. Even that seems odd, Mr. Hatfield commented. I've checked, and Jacques never was a member of any Webster City den. I only hope that whoever took the boy away treats him right. Those bruises the doctor mentioned rather trouble me. Failure to learn what had become of Jacques disturbed not only Mr. Hatfield, but all the cubs. During the next three days, the topic was a major one of discussion at the cave. The cub leader reported Jacques' disappearance to the police, but was informed that no boy of his description had been reported missing. At first, the cubs spent many hours trying to decipher the coded message which Dan and Brad had removed from Jacques' clothing. Failing to figure it out or to hear more of the boy, the matter began to fade into the background. Only Dan remained determined to work out the code. Meanwhile, the cubs turned their attention to an important swimming meet, which had been scheduled with the boys of Den 1. In a meet held the month before, the rival Den had captured top honors by a score of 20 to 16. Defeat rankled in their hearts of the Den 2 Cubs, who were determined to make a better showing in the second contest. A total of three meets had been scheduled for this season. An engraved silver loving cup would be awarded to the Den, which won two of the contest. I'm afraid Ross Langdon 
We'll win the Saturday meet, too, Dan remarked glumly one afternoon as he practiced with the other cubs at the Y pool. That guy swims as if he's jet propelled. Although Dan won boasted several fine swimmers, 11-year-old Ross was by far the greatest threat to the rival cubs. Muscularly built, the boy had the energy of a youngster of 15. His crawl stroke lacked form, but by sheer strength he managed to win every race he entered. You swim as well as Ross does, Brad told Dan loyally. Your form is better. Maybe, Dan admitted, but I lack his endurance. I hold out fairly well in the 25-yard freestyle, but in the 50 I begin to lose my wind. And you know, we've got to capture both events to nose out Den 1 in the final tally. I sure do know, Brad acknowledged, easing his body, snake fashion down the pool wall into the chlorinated water. Just get in and pitch, old boy. Remember, the den is counting on you. That's what makes me worried, Brad. I want to do my best. I practice and I practice, but where does it get me? Sam Hatfield emerged from the dressing room in time to hear Dan's final remark. You just keep plugging, and top speed will come, Dan, he said cheerfully. Stop worrying about Ross Langdon. One of these days, his lack of form will catch up with him. Now, dive into the pool and swim eight lanes. Eight, groaned Dan. Eight, the cub leader repeated firmly. It's the only way you'll ever build up your endurance. When the going gets hard, just keep going. Inspired by this advice, Dan dived into the water and with smooth strokes slashed his way the first length of the pool. After a turn at the wall, his breath became a little short and he slowed down a little. By the end of the third length, his stroke lost some of its hard drive. At fifth, five lengths, his steady six-beat leg thrash became a tired wiggle. Finally, at the end of the eighth length, Dan was holding out by sheer willpower. Keep it up, Mr. Hatfield called encouragingly. You're doing fine. At that moment, Ross Langdon sauntered into the pool. Large for his age, a natural athlete, the boy's appearance at the Y were few and far between, and he disliked to practice. On this afternoon, however, he had donned satin trunks, showered, and evidently intended to swim. Observing Dan's now jerky strokes, he uttered a loud horse laugh. Then, to show off, he plunged into the pool and swam the length with a speed which tossed foam ahead of his thrashing arms. Thoroughly discouraged by the display, Dan wheeled over to the side to watch. What's the use, he muttered to Brad, who slithered alongside the wall. I couldn't quite finish eight length, and here's Ross blazing in and tears up the pool. That's all right, Dan, Brad encouraged him. You won't see him doing more than a few lengths before he caves in. You just keep plugging the way Mr. Hatfield said. By the meet time, it's Saturday, you'll have time to practice. And look at the guy travel. His form may not be so hot. But how can he chop the water? Well aware that the cubs of Den 2 were watching, Ross swam another lane, finishing off with a snappy turn at the wall. Then he pulled himself from the pool, stretching out on the tile floor to relax. See, I told you, Brad muttered, as soon as the going gets hard, he quits. To win the 25-yard and the 50-dash, he won't need... Too much reserve, Dan sighed. Well, I sure do my best to win, Dan said, but I've got a dark brown feeling. On Saturday, the day set for the swimming meet, enthusiasm had mounted to high pitch. By two o'clock, all the cubs, their parents, and many other spectators had gathered at the Y to witness the contest. Five events had been scheduled. Fancy diving, the 25-yard freestyle race, the 50-yard swim, and a 100-yard relay and a backstroke event. Points were to be awarded on the basis of five for first place, three for second, and one for third. According to the rules, each time team 
was allowed to enter two contestants in an event. Den 2 swung off to a good start with Brad taking top honors and Mitch Holloway coming in third. This lead of 6 to 3 brought enthusiastic cheers from the gallery. The second event, the racing back crawl, proved discouraging to Den 2. Though Chip Davis swam an excellent race, he lost one of the of the Den 1 boys. Den 2, however, managed to snare both second and third places, giving them a total of 10 to 8. From now on, it will be a nip and tuck, Brad said grimly, as the 25-yard freestyle was called. So far, Ross Langdon hasn't had a chance to swim. At the crack of the gun, Dan and Ross hit the water together. From the very first moment of the race, it was evident to the spectators that the remainder of the meet would resolve itself into a battle between these two swimmers. Though Dan exerted his best efforts, Ross won the event by an easy six-foot margin. Dan was awarded second place, while another swimmer from Den 1 captured the third position. The scoreboard proclaimed the discouraging totals. Den 1, 14. Den 2, 13. Only two events remained, the 50-yard freestyle and the 100-yard relay. However, Ross was entered in both events, and the Cubs knew his flashy speed could be counted upon to win for his den. That boy is in top form today, if you can say he has any form at all. Midge muttered, slapping Dan encouragingly on the back. Well, get in there and show him. Sure, sure, Dan laughed, but his words had a hollow ring. As the Cubs of Den 2 expected, their rivals walked away with the relay by a score of 20 to 16. Fat chance for a hive of winning now, Dan said as the final event of the meet was called. We'd have to make a complete sweep, and we'll be lucky to capture one place. It sure looks bad for Den 2, Brad agreed. But get in there and fight, boy. Ross acts a bit winded. He may not be able to hold out. In the 50-yard freestyle, the Cubs were required to swim two lanes to the pool. Before the start of the race, an official reminded the boys that they must remain in their lanes and touch the walls at the turn or be disqualified. At the crack of the gun, Ross and Dan were off to a fast start, followed by a field of slower swimmers. As Brad had observed, Ross seemed somewhat tired from his earlier performances. His stroke looked ragged and jerky, but Dan, in contrast, forged smoothly ahead, pressing him hard every inch of the way. At the turn, the two rivals were racing almost even. Determined to gain a lead, Ross lunged for the wall, his fingertips missing it by a scant margin. So rapidly did he turn that few noticed. Dan, tucking into a tight ball, also made a fast turn, but touched the wall. His shove-off, however, was weak. When his head came out of the water for a gulp of air, he was disconcerted to see that Ross was a full body length ahead. Come on, Dan, his teammates yelled encouragingly. You can do it. Dan dug in, but his breath was coming hard. Despite his best efforts, he could not recapture the lead. In a moment, it seemed, the race was over. Ross had touched the finish wall a scant arm's length ahead and was congratulated as a winner. For the members of Den 2, it was slight consolation that Mac had won third place, nosing out Den 1 swimmer. The scoreboard proclaimed Den 1 the victor by a total of 25 to 20. Congratulations, Ross, Den said, offering his hand. You swam a fine race. Thanks, the other boy grinned. You weren't so bad yourself. Pressed me plenty hard at first. Other members of Den 1 had gathered in a little group. After talking rather excitedly, they called Ross over. The other cubs could not hear what was being said, but they gathered that Ross himself was the topic of conversation. Apparently, he disagreed with his teammates about some matter, for his voice rose in sharp protest. Then the Cubs heard him say, Scully, Okay, if you want to be saps, go ahead. It makes me sick after the way I work to win for the team. 
Ross's teammates talked to their coach briefly. Then, before the audience, or Den 2 swimmers, could leave the pool, a whistle blasted their attention. Ladies and gentlemen, we regret that an error has been made in scoring, and official announcement has to be made. It has been brought to our notice that one of the contestants, Ross Langdon, failed to touch the wall at the end of the first length. A buzz of conversation greeted this announcement. Brad and Dan glanced quickly at each other and then at Ross. The face of the latter was as black as the summer rainstorm. Due to this infraction of the rules, Ross has been disqualified and the officials continued, Dan Carter wins first place. A mighty cheer rocked the pool gallery. Even heavier applause broke out as new figures went up on the scoreboard. Den 2, 24. Den 1, 21. Brad and the other Den 2 teammates swarmed about Dan, clapping him on his dripping shoulders. Dan, you did it, Red Sewell congratulated him. Now the matches are even. If we win the third meet, that silver cup is in the bag. If is right, Dan laughed. Don't forget, this victory was a fluke. From Mr. Hatfield, the Cubs learned that only the good sportsmanship of Den 1's teammate had been responsible for the success. Ross himself had no mention of his failure to touch the wall, and his error had gone unnoticed by the officials. Two of Den 1's swimmers saw Ross miss the turn, the Cub leader revealed. They reasoned that honor means more than victory. A Cub always is square, Dan quoted thoughtfully. That's right, Mr. Hatfield agreed. I'm proud of our boys for winning, but equally proud of the other team for reporting the incident. The swimmers of Den 1 gathered around to congratulate Dan and his teammates. Ross, however, had slipped away to the dressing room without a word. He's a little sore, one of his teammates remarked, but he'll get over it. The coach, the coach warned Ross plenty of times to be careful about that turn. He never paid much attention. Feeling on top of the world, Dan showered and dressed. As he was getting his things from the locker, he bumped squarely into Ross. Dan waited a moment, expecting the other boy to offer some word of congratulation. When Ross said nothing, he remarked, You had a tough break, fellow. Ross gave a snort of disgust. I'll say it was a tough break, he agreed. In a straight race, you couldn't win, and we both know it. Then remarked, annoyed Dan. Oh, I don't know, he drawled. My stroke is improving every day. I noticed that you were pretty well winded at the finish. Bunk. I didn't even exert myself. Anyhow, now that the two teams are tied, it'll make a good meet when the final contest is scheduled, Dan said, trying to ease out of a disagreeable conversation. Sure, Ross said, his eyes flashing. Maybe you can dig up another technical point and win the cup. You'll never earn it on your own. And with that challenge, he brushed past Dan and slouched out of the dressing room. Da-do-da-do. Da,